My name is Alan Watke, and I'm on the event staff here where we host close to a thousand authors a year. Um, yeah, for a full list of everything that's confirmed for the next three months, you can go to our website at politics-pros.com, or you can pick up one of our printed uh, events calendars throughout the store. Uh, before we get started today, I'd like to ask everyone to please take this time to silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the crowd and the event. Um, when it's time for the Q&A, we have a microphone right up here at this aisle. If you could please speak into the microphone. Um, we are audio recording this, and we're also video recording it, so you know, please also keep your questions a uh, question. Um, and uh, following the Q&A, we'll have a signing right up here, and the books are available at the register, so if you haven't already purchased those, we have plenty of those available. Um, and then once the event is done, if you could fold up your chairs and place them against something solid, that would be a huge help. We would greatly appreciate that. So without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome Glenn Simpson and Peter Fritsch to Politics and Prose, uh, discussing their book, Crime in Progress, Inside the Steele Dossier and the Fusion GPS Investigation of Donald Trump. Uh, Simpson, a former Wall Street Journal senior reporter and Frisch, a former national security editor, founded Fusion GPS in 2010 to conduct open source investigations. In 2015, they were hired to look into Trump's finances, and as they sifted through the documents of bankruptcies and overseas projects, a reoccurrence of Russian names alerted them to a larger, more serious matter. Uh, working with Christopher Steele, a former British intelligence agent, they compiled the evidence that became known as the Steele dossier, uh, which ended up taking a leading a lead role in the current historic impeachment trial and launched the Mueller investigation. Uh, telling the full story of Fusion's work for the first time, Simpson and Frisch add to the record uh, their findings of Trump's ties to organized crime and their account of how they unsuccessfully tried to raise alarms over Russia's bid to sway the vote. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Glenn Simpson and Peter Frisch. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Peter. That's Glenn. Um, thanks for coming on a. That's Glenn. I'm Peter. <laughs> Did that work? Yeah. Okay. You gotta like almost, almost kiss it. Thanks. Um, well, so thanks a lot for coming and your interest in our book and our tale, such as it is. Um, we are former journalists, and we, as the intro, as our host mentioned, we started this company about 10 years ago. Glenn started first in, a, in an iteration. I joined him. We were colleagues together at the Wall Street Journal for many years. I think we all started together about 25 years ago in 1995. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to run through some quick bio stuff. I was mostly an overseas reporter. I worked in Mexico, Brazil, Southeast Asia, and, and Glenn and I worked together in Europe. Glenn was a investigative reporter here in town. He started, he's been here his whole career. Uh, yeah, I, I went to George Washington University, and uh, then to the Washington Times, and then to a Capitol Hill newspaper roll call. Ended up at the Wall Street Journal around 94, 95. Um, and uh, Peter and I crossed paths uh, briefly uh, in the early years once, and then uh, again we worked together along with my wife, Mary Jacoby, uh, who has a role in this yarn as well, um, uh, in, in the mid-2000s. Uh, around 2006, we all started working together in Brussels, uh, and that was uh, in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union. There was a lot of crazy stuff going on, a scramble for wealth. Um, in the former Soviet Union, which uh, was one of the, the stories I decided I wanted to cover. Um, and so, uh, along with my wife, um, we started digging into the rise in kleptocracy and organized crime coming from the East, the former Soviet Union. And one of the first, one of the guys we came across in the early days was a guy named Paul Manafort. You may have heard of him. Um, who at that time was a virtual, he had been forgotten by the Washington establishment, was a, and was now, you know, was then trying to sort of monetize his contacts and lists on behalf of oligarchs tied to Putin's Russia. 
So uh, when he resurfaced in March of 2016 as the campaign manager for the now president, um, that was quite a, sh a shock to us. Right, and he was not the only familiar name. Um, uh, also in this period, we wrote about uh, an oligarch named Oleg Deripaska, uh, wrote some stories about him, and another one in Ukraine named Dmitry Firtash, um, who um, may be familiar if you follow the ins and outs of the current impeachment drama as the sort of oligarch lurking in the background of that whole, ep of this current episode. Um, it was really fascinating journalism at the time. It seemed like a really great, exciting area to be writing about, um, but we never dreamed that we would, you know, come back to it in this way. Um, and indeed, uh, at the time that we were writing these stories, uh, people weren't particularly interested. They weren't terribly easy to get into the newspaper. Um, editors were sort of like, why do we care? Um, what about Osama? You know, and it was a lot of, you know, what about Osama? And which is something else that I wrote a lot about. Peter and I both covered terrorism. Um, and uh, there was a lot of other things going on at the time. Uh, Iraq, we had invaded Iraq by then, and it was uh, going great. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> Hurricane Katrina was happening around then, too. So there was a lot of other stuff going on. Anyway, so it, this is all, Russia and the former Soviet Union was a place that people were happy to not be thinking much about anymore after the end of the Cold War. And, you know, sure enough, um, we left it. Yeah, so the other terrain to cover perhaps is, you know, sort of why we left the Wall Street Journal when we did and, and why we started this thing. Um, you know, and people mistakenly infer that, you know, Rupert Murdoch had something to do with it. Well, that's not, that's not totally true. He did have something to do with it. Um, but it wasn't so much ideological as the, as the journal in the old days was a really fun place to work because it was something of a second read, right? If you live in Boston, you get the Boston Globe and, you know, you'd also read, you'd supplement your understanding of events with the Wall Street Journal. So as a journalist, that was a great place to work because it meant by definition you were doing a lot more enterprise sort of reporting and writing. Um, when Murdoch came along, he decided to compete for those first read eyeballs with all the other sort of regional papers circling the drain, whether it's the Houston Chronicle or, you know, you name it. Um, so that became for kind of mid-career, later career people, a little less interesting place to work. Um, so we decided to start this. Glenn started out on his own with another partner and I joined a year later um, on the theory or on the supposition that there was still a great need for deep, deeply researched open source investigation. You know, we're now kind of infamous, famous for the stuff we don't actually do, which is what Chris Deal does. Um, you know, what we do is you would recognize mostly as kind of very document-driven reporting and writing. Right. So there was, I mean, there was never a big market for the kind of stories that I did, um, which were uh, very intricate sort of yarns involving lots of documents and numbers and funny names. Um, uh, but the people that, that did read my stories cared intensely about them. Uh, they usually had something at stake, um, whether it was, you know, personal or financial, but it was frequently financial. Um, and that sort of went out of fashion in the news biz. And so, um, you know, I, I sort of thought about what I really wanted to do with life and what I liked and what I didn't like. And, um, you know, I, I realized that my sort of passion was um, unspooling these kinds of tales. And uh, so I looked for a new way uh, to continue to do that. And it occurred to me, um, that all the, the small number of people who cared so much about my stories when I wrote them for the newspaper might also care enough to finance that kind of work um, uh, outside of a newspaper. And so that was the theory behind Fusion GPS. Right. So, I mean, what we do mostly is, you know, we do a lot of work for law firms and complicated disputes. And because we have some sort of writing skills, we try and make sense of complicated sort of subject matter. Um, you know, w I would say we rely a lot on our colleagues, many of whom are here, uh, and also our sort of network. If you spend a career or a lifetime, you know, living, working overseas and working in D.C. and trying to figure things out without the benefit of a badge or subpoena power, you get pretty crafty. Um, so, you know, that's kind of our model in a nutshell. And so in the early years of, of the company, um, we didn't do any campaign work, or at least not that I can recall. Um, it was mostly 
lawsuits and uh, blue chip companies. Um, we did do some very Washington type work, uh, have done uh, policy disputes. Um, we're doing research for one side or another in a policy dispute, uh, which I sometimes refer to as trucks versus trains. And um, um, and uh, other uh, competitions, contracting competitions, that sort of thing. Uh, but in 2012, uh, an old friend of mine from my political reporting days um, came along uh, and said he thought that the Republicans were going to nominate Mitt Romney to be their candidate, um, and that the, uh, the, the classic opposition research uh, community was not equipped to look into the background of a private equity tycoon. Um, and so we were asked if we might be interested in doing that. And of course, that sounded like a fun job, um, which is generally how we evaluate whether to do some work. <laughs> um, and um, that we did. And uh, we found out lots of interesting stuff. And um, it was really fun. And uh, the other guy won, which also helps. <laughs> and. Um, so that's how we got into the political business, which wasn't from desire. The, the um, oppo research industry in DC is a low-end business. Um, campaigns don't pay much for that kind of work, as anyone who's been around a campaign can attest. Um, there's a lot of volunteers that do that work, or college kids uh, or just out of college. Um, and, and we sort of had the opposite end. We're sort of mid-late career guys. and. We don't do anything for cheap. We do it really well, but not cheap. I actually think we're really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and you should probably hire us. So, um, so that's, how, th that's the, how we get to 2015, um, which is having done it in 2012 and enjoyed it, um, when, 20, when the 2016 election started to roll around, we started to talk about whether there might be another, you know, piece of work there that we might want to do. Um, and, you know, as the book recounts, we talked about whether we would go to work for Hillary Clinton, and I was very unenthusiastic because previously in my career I had covered the Clinton scandals and gotten very tired of uh, being around the Clintons because they're just one scandal after another. So reason to suspect there might be more scandals in her future. Um, Anyway, it was it was early in the, it was early in the cycle, so we decided uh, to see if anyone was interested in investigating another self-proclaimed billionaire, um, Donald Trump. And um, it it uh, took some really expert sleuthing to find um, some old New York Times articles and books about <laughs> Donald Trump, um, in, in which you know a lot, much of it is foretold, right? You, we. Methodologically, I'm kind of joking a little bit, but you know, one of the first things we end up doing is, and this sounds like really rote and simple, but we buy every book about a subject and we tear them apart and OCR, optical character, recognize them so you can search them and look for stuff and find stuff. So if you do went through that exercise in the first month or two, you find that Donald Trump has partnered up with a lot of you know colorful individuals, um, some of whom um, you know did some hard time. Um, so there's not a lot of presidential candidates who have, um, you know, share office space with people with business cards who had done hard time. So, yeah, or, or and there's not a lot of presidential candidates who have been sued five thousand times, right? <laughs> I mean, and you know, gone through you know half a dozen bankruptcies. Um, so we we were you know, uh, well we should add that as as a creature of Washington and Peter as being mostly a foreign correspondent. Neither of us knew much about Donald Trump, nor did we care much about Donald Trump. He was uh, just a silly guy from New York who was in the New York Post a lot. And um, so we were kind of knocked over to see what a character he really was. And it was a little hard to believe that he was going to last very long. Um, but last he did. Um, and so it went on and on. And it was pretty obvious from his bankruptcies and looking at his business career that he had been essentially a colossal failure at everything he tried his hand at. Uh, and that you know his new model was to be a host for parasitic overseas money that was looking for a place to live. Um, uh, and that's basically what he became. So all of this work was done for a Republican client, as the uh, book recounts. Um, it was a, a conservative newspaper here in Washington, Free Beacon. Um, you know, that's one of the, the many myths about 
our story is that we're some kind of democratic hatchet men, but actually uh, we have no particular uh, allegiance or, or tie to the Democratic Party other than we know people in the Democratic Party just like we know Republicans. And it was Republicans who were paying the bills for all of this work um, all the way through to the spring of 2016 when um, you know we did such a great job, Donald Trump was apparently locking up the nomination. <laughs> um, um, so another important aspect of that is that um, this whole time, A, we were working for Republicans, almost all of it, um, but B, the famous um, Christopher Steele was nowhere in sight. And you know the uh, original concern about Donald Trump's overseas entanglements was generated inside Fusion GPS when we started looking at some of his partners and where his sources of capital came from um, and who his customers were. Um, and it was a very sort of fact-based accumulation of uh, in information that caused us to become increasingly concerned uh, about whether he had some overseas uh, ties that were unsavory. Um, uh, that all uh, was greatly magnified in the late winter, early spring of 2016 when Manafort appeared on the scene. And uh, I would say you can imagine, but you probably can't. But you know, for this guy from our past to suddenly you know, walk on stage in the middle of this titanically important presidential election as Donald, one of Donald Trump's key advisors, we just couldn't believe it. And uh, as, as we write in the book, it was like you know he had boarded the Trump campaign plane with a bag of explosives. We just figured, <laughs> you know, this, this is gonna end badly. And, and he was so kind of out of pol U.S. politics at that point that, you know, we were looking, and Glenn actually found some documents hiding in plain sight in Virginia court, and it, they actually were hiding because it's actually difficult to, to, to find some of this stuff. Um, and we found this lawsuit from the Cayman Islands, and they tried to serve him in Virginia, and the process server couldn't find him. Like, they literally could not find him. And, and when, That's how off the radar he was. And, and when we looked at, at the lawsuit and who might be behind it, we began to suspect and then became fairly confident that it was said Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska, who can't even, for many years, couldn't enter the United States because he's considered an organized crime figure. So. Now you got another really interesting aspect of the Trump campaign is the campaign chairman um, is in business with a, a mob guy from Russia who's buddies with Putin and owes him ten million dollars. At, at least, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so why do we write this book? I guess um, you know we the uh, well so 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 much sort of after the fact, right? The dossier was published famously by BuzzFeed in early 2017. Um, and then, you know, we had our fun with Congress, uh, the uh, Judiciary Committee in the Senate uh, asked us to uh, um, provide information, which we did, Glenn did, um, same with the House Intelligence Committee. So after, you know, we had a lot of legal tough sledding there for a while, um, some private lawsuits as well. You know, it, but we got kind of tired of being caricatured as people who actually were just out there hiring guns for, you know, ex-spies for hire. Uh, and we thought there was a much more, a deeper, richer, and more important story to tell about, you know, our investigation and what we found. So that's why we did it. Right. And we, of course, were writing all of this while Donald Trump was out doing the whole thing over again. Um, and... Uh, we didn't know that, but um, you know it, the book I think does shed a lot of light on the current impeachment, which really grows out of this uh, decades long now tussle between Russia and Ukraine over energy and political dominance, um, and the issues that we were writing about back in the mid two thousands are now at the very center of this crisis that is gripping our country, and it's it's a little hard to believe, but if you're trying to understand where it comes from. Um, then this book may help. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know. Should we should we open it up? I mean, I think. Yeah, I mean, in, in you know, in Washington, of all places, I think this is a great place to to just answer for us to just answer questions rather than tell you what we think you should think.
What can you tell us about the P-tape? <laughs> wait, well, wait. We'll, be, we'll be showing that at the end of the program tonight. <laughs> It'll do well. I mean, you, you know, joking aside, I mean, what we can tell you is that um, that was reporting Christopher Steele's sources developed, um, as far as we know, and hasn't been categorically denied. It's been denied, um, but it has not been disproven. I, it's just important to back up and just sort of describe Chris Steele and his methodology a little bit. Um, you know, so what he's trained to do is accurately re record and reflect what people say. Um, you know, of course, he is an expert in counterintelligence and in disinformation, so there's a lot of editorial decisions that go into the creation of a document like that that we're not privy to. Um, but, you know, what we think to this day is that at, that information is credible, which is different than it being true, right? But it's credible. Right. Um, there's some discussion in the book uh, about the sort of our reaction to this and um, our differences of opinion, and I think it sheds light on sort of our perspectives, which for Chris, this was really um, significant information because uh, he is involved in counterintelligence work and has been all his life. And uh, a lot of counterintelligence work involves determining whether someone has been compromised and can be blackmailed. Um, and there is, you know, many different ways that one can be compromised and compromat doesn't actually refer to sex, it just means compromise. And you can financially compromise someone, you know, you could catch them beating their dog, you know, um, or you could catch them in a, a sexual peccadillo. In any event, he, he was concerned about it from a counterintelligence perspective. Um, we're not counterintelligence guys, we're ex-reporters. And um, we were coming at this from a journalistic slash political perspective um, and you know, if it was just kind of neither here nor there to some extent for us. Um, uh, it certainly wasn't something that seemed like you could follow it up. So, um, <clears throat> so um, you know, it was a real hot potato, um, and we didn't know what to do with it. But the headline finding is far more serious, right? Which is that there is a pattern of coordination or compromise, whatever you want to call it, between the Trump campaign um, and Vladimir Putin's Russia. You'll. So if you read the Mueller report, you'll find that there are about 140-odd contacts between the Trump campaign and, uh, you know, the Russian government, or cutouts for the Russian government. And we know that Donald Trump has spent a lot of time and energy trying not to explain those contacts. So have his men, some of whom are in prison. So, Right. And that, and that was the thing that really we were concerned about at that time. So we didn't really focus on this one allegation so much as the big picture that was beginning to emerge, which was that um, this guy had been over to Russia a bunch. There was a lot of mystery in what had happened in those trips. Um, and, you know, it seemed like the Russians were pulling for him. And so, you know, the, 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 picture, the bigger picture was what was so disturbing that was emerging in June, May, June of 2016. Can you say anything about the role of, of Deutsche Bank and any any possible money laundering? I mean, we've looked at this on and off um, uh, since I guess 2015, um, and they, you know, th there's no question that it is odd um, that this bank has been willing to put up so much money for a person who has screwed so many other banks, um, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it's also true that Deutsche Bank has extensive relationships in Russia um, that go straight to the Russian leadership. Um, it's also true that Deutsche Bank has laundered an enormous amount of money from Russia through the United States, for which I should add, they've never been prosecuted. Um, and uh, so we looked at all of that quite extensively. And in fact, you know, some of it is recounted in the book and, and in other books that are, uh, I think, coming out now. Um, and uh, we don't think it makes sense. We think their explanations for it don't make sense. I mean, you know, helpfully, uh, the House Intelligence Committee went to court to force us to turn over our bank records, which was used as a precedent 
in a federal ruling in which Deutsche Bank will be required to turn over its records. So to I, the I'm House. yeah, I'm quite confident that we have not heard the last of the Deutsche Bank story, um, and that there's a lot uh, of, of stuff there that is yet to come. Peter, when when you talked about testifying in front of Congress, you sort of glossed over it, but uh, we're friends, and I remember thinking how terrifying it must have been to have the majority in the House, the majority in the Senate, and the President of the United States gunning for your skulls. And it is not an ordinary human being who could withstand that with the dignity and the professionalism that you both did. That's what makes you guys national heroes. <clears throat> so, so my question, uh, my question is, was there a time when you ever, both of you thought to yourself, maybe this just isn't worth it? The money, the fear, the stress, the threats to my family. Did you ever think maybe it just isn't worth it? Go ahead. Go ahead. Anyway, it, it helps to, it, on the one hand, and I'm being a little glib, you know, to not have a choice. When you're subpoenaed by Congress and your elected representatives are asking for your um, testimony, you know, yes, there is the Fifth Amendment, and we did have to avail ourselves of that in a couple of instances. But in the end, we chose to um, provide fulsome testimony. I'll, you know, I'll say that when the House Intelligence Committee interviewed Glenn, and he took the brunt of this, um, they start. They started out. Ask. They started out in the first in the morning for about two hours, broke for lunch and to go vote. Then they came back. Excuse me, the Democrats came back. The Republicans weren't even interested in hearing from Glenn for the last five hours of testimony, right? They didn't even care because they were not on a fact-finding mission. They were on a character assassination, assassination mission. Right, so when it comes to answering questions, I've answered pretty much every question you can imagine, and I've done it in an official bodies. Um, and for, you know, one, one of my sessions was 10 hours long. Um, and some of the questions were, when did you start working for Vladimir Putin? Um, um, why, uh, you know, w w how come you haven't registered as a foreign lobbyist? Um, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, but we submitted to a lot of that. In any event, to answer the question that you asked, um, as Peter says, uh, there is no off-ramp to this. Um, you know, it's true for the rest of you as well. Um, it's our country. We live here. Um, Thought about leaving, decided not to. So here we are. Um, and uh, we all just going to have to deal with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So you've explained what happened. Could you tell us why? Trump is so indebted to Russia with all of the information that you, you have. The why rather than the what. So I'll make a stab at it. Um, there are things we know and there are things we don't know. Um, and as we, as we say at the end of the book, I mean, you know, um, some of this is an enduring mystery. Um, his behavior towards Putin is so singular um, as to be compelling um, in, in Disha that there is a debt there, a level of loyalty that goes beyond a, a, a bro thing. Um, it's, um, what, we can, what we show, what we showed in our research was that an enormous amount of money had flown, flowed from the former Soviet Union into Donald Trump's businesses um, in the like, last 10 years before he ran for president. Um, and this was a time when he had burned all of his bridges with banks um, with other business partners, um, with customers. Um, and so he's, his, his sort of survival as a real estate tycoon really was dependent on this flow of dubious money from the former Soviet Union into his businesses, as he himself and his, his children um, occasionally bragged. And his, you know, and his, his, the burning of those bridges coincided pretty, uh, overlapped almost exactly with the moment post, you know, early thousands, early aughts when Vladimir Putin was consolidating power. And the way he did that was to co-opt, you know, industry, right, and create the famous kleptocracy we now know. And, and you know, sometimes we get asked, do you believe that Donald Trump is an asset? And, you know, that's a term of art, as again, we're not in the espionage business. Um, what 
you know, what we can say, though, is he's for sure compromised. I mean, he was compromised when he started lying about how he had no business in Russia all through the campaign when it turned out he was actually negotiating to build a building in Russia during the campaign. So what they worry about in counterintelligence isn't just whether you might have cheated on your spouse. Um, they, it's a shared secret is the, is the essence of a compromise. So the fact that the Russians knew that Donald Trump was lying to the American people in the middle of the campaign about his business relationship with Russia means he's compromised. Um, that means they got something on him, or at least they did until it finally came out. And there's, a, and there's a, a lot of money flows have yet to be explained. We still, I don't know anyone who's figured out where the $50 million that came through an Icelandic fund into the Trump Soho companies you know, actually came from. Um, there are a lot of theories and compelling theories. The partners were from the, in that project were in the, from the former Soviet Union. So. so it's primarily monetary and debt. And that's that's, well, that's what, what that's we know and what we don't know. But, you know, I mean, that's we're former Wall Street Journal guys. So we focused on the money. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you guys have done. Um, my question is, what do you wish the Mueller report would have said or done differently or helped move further along? Well, I mean, uh, you know, first, uh, first thing to say, I, or observation I'd make, is that the Mueller report was actually um, quite magisterial in its scope and in its, in its, you know, in its breadth, right? You know, I mean, it was really an ambitious report. You know, a lot of people were disappointed because it didn't get into some of the things that we're talking about now, right, in terms of overseas compromise. You have to understand that, you know, Mueller could have turned himself into a per, per, you know semi-permanent fixture prosecutorial presence like Ken Starr did. He didn't. He decided to create a scope and look at a, a set of issues around provable crimes in this country, right? Obviously, his subpoena power did not extend to places like Iceland, to places like Germany. So for what he did, and he did find, as I, as I mentioned earlier, 140 odd unexplained contacts between Russians and the Trump campaign. Right. I'm, I'd add that um, for one thing, you know, the Mueller report. Uh, we don't actually know what's what uh, everything that's in the Mueller report because a lot of it was blacked out. Um, and uh, so I think it's it's still actually early to be judging the Mueller report because I think there's a lot of it, additional information in there that um, the Attorney General censored. Um, that's probably pretty damning, but. You know, but uh, the, if I had my wishes, my one wish would be um, that he had simply uh, stated simply what he obviously thinks, which is the only reason I couldn't crack this case is because they lied and hid uh, key evidence. And I mean, if you you know if you're used to reading things like this and covering investigations, I mean, this was a hell of an investigation, and they found a ton of stuff. Um, and if you you know. Ask them informally. Do they think that Trump conspired with the Russians? They'd say yes. And um, as and as we know, he Robert Mueller did testify that that there are a lot of matters that he assumes or presumes that are part of an ongoing counterintelligence investigation, which so, may be like a Raiders Raiders of the Lost Ark thing, right. and you never see it. But I, you know, this is I mean, what we kind of reflect on a lot these days is the power of propaganda, which you know seemed to have gone out of style after World War II, and is now back with a vengeance. Um, and the propaganda around the Mueller report and the Russian investigation in general really has colored a lot of people's uh, thinking outside of the you know, hard right. Um, and the messaging is so repetitive um, that it starts to really sink in with casual observers uh, who think, oh, the Russia thing turned out not to be true. Like, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, not only that, but you know, the president said it's ludicrous that Donald Trump would ever attempt to collude with a foreign government to win an election. How <laughs> absurd! <laughs> right? So then he went and did it again the day after Mueller testified. Literally the day after. Well, my question is, what about Carter Page? Because I did read the Mueller report up to the last 30 pages of the inside part and it just seems uh carter page has an interesting story attached to him i mean so he was he was as we know from 
documents that were later revealed, he was targeted by Russian intelligence in the, Glenn will correct me, 2013 period, I want to say? Uh, actually, it was twice. Uh, right. That was one of them, yes. Right, and he has, in his public statements before joining the campaign as a senior overseas advisor, someone who never heard of, um, uh, you know, was working a lot with Russia. He was partnered with a guy named Yatsenko who was a Gazprom, Gazprom executive, um, Gazprom being, you know, state company, basically. So he's a curious character. And, you know, we, we have chronicled um, the many things that he... Uh, said after he became a controversial figure that turned out not to be true. He said, oh, no one in the campaign knew I was there. Uh, this wasn't had nothing to do with the campaign. Well, actually, he was sending emails back to the campaign saying, boy, I just talked to all these top Russian officials and they really want to be friends, <laughs> you know? And it was great. And, you know, so he made many, many misstatements about who he met with, why he went there, um, uh, it's funny that he hasn't actually been prosecuted for that, I think because he's made so many confusing comments, it w it's not clear he knows what the truth is himself. Um, in any event, he's not a civil liberties victim. Uh, he's not a poster child for the evils of government surveillance. Um, can you guys talk about some of the aha moments where your staff bunch of the best in the business found things that changed the aspect of your investigation? I mean, again, a lot of it was sort of hiding in plain sight. One uh, aha moment for me was, again, you know, in a book, uh, Tim O'Brien's book, in which he talks about Trump Tower being one of the few, if uh, rare, comp uh, buildings in New York that allowed uh, anonymous foreign uh, n um, domiciled LLCs to, to buy property, residential property in Manhattan. So when you pair that with the fact that you had other known criminals, w one of whom was later at the uh, Miss Universe pageant 2013 with Donald Trump, there's a known criminal who's running a poker ring out of, out of Trump Tower for high rollers, including the likes of Leonardo DiCaprio and Alex Rodriguez, you know, go Nationals. Um, you know, uh, so, so those things start to stack up as kind of a kind of a rolling, ongoing aha moment. Yeah, I mean, the one that comes to mind was uh, had to do with Manafort, and that was it was actually after the election, but uh, really kind of an important, eye-opening moment for uh, us and the rest of the world when Taylor, uh, who's sitting right there, uh, Taylor Shears, one of our uh, analysts. Um, was, rec was requesting all of these documents from Cyprus um, that we thought were involved companies that we suspected Manafort had something to do with. And, you know, we kept coming back with nothing. Um, and then all of a sudden we just hit the jackpot. And uh, we found all of these audit reports uh, that showed all of this money um, from these Cyprus, Cyprus companies that seemed to be flowing into Manafort's various uh, assets and entities in the United States in the form of loans. Um, and that was really an aha moment. I, you know, essentially, how could he be getting $20 million in loans from these companies in Cyprus that don't really do anything? Um, and uh, you know, we just know from our backgrounds in financial journalism that um, it's a way of avoiding taxes. If you, lend your, if you take, take out loans, then you don't have to pay taxes on the income. Um, because you're presumed to be paying it back someday. Um, and then we saw things like, you know, the securitization process around some of the properties, the Trump properties in Panama, Toronto, uh, in which, which mirrored what he was doing in Soho and other places in which he was basically, uh, it, was, it was basically a Ponzi scheme where you are taking purported, you know, putative sales and using them as a security to then go ahead and sell on down the line. Right, which you know they got sued for in in Soho, for example. Yeah, I but mean, I forget who pointed it out to us, but you know what we did over the years was to try and look at all of the more controversial or suspicious developments that he was behind Soho, Toronto, you know, some in Florida, um, and eventually we got to Panama, and um, we were like, "There's got to be something there," um, and sure enough, you know. So one of our people got uh, 
the company records that showed that like all of these Russian and Ukrainian characters, some of whom did turn out to be mobsters, um, were the early buyers. And uh, this guy who did this work for us explained that, oh yeah, well, in a condo fraud, basically what you do is you get a bunch of fake buyers to um, claim that they purchased condos so that you can hype the fact that you've been selling lots of condos. And that was kind of an aha, because we had seen that in other places, in other cases. And in fact, uh, that's what um, Ivanka and Donald Jr. almost got indicted for in New York City. And so uh, once we understood the racket, um, then we could see it had taken place all over, right? In all of these developments, they all had this one hallmark, which is that they vastly overstated the number of buyers in the early years of the project, um, and then they would overstate and understate, depending on what it was convenient, um, their own financial stake. So they'd say, oh yeah, we're big, big, we have a big investment in this, and they would use that in the selling. And then when they, the project started going under, they said, oh, well, we were just the, we, we just licensed our brand, sorry. It's too bad Trump's stakes didn't take off. That would have been a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> One of Donald Trump's policy objectives as president is the repeal of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, and I saw a story today where he actually asked Rex Tillerson to do it for him. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything that you have unearthed that sheds some sort of background on why this is important to him. Well, the aforementioned, right? I mean, there's a, lo a lot of foreign money coming in. I mean, the, the irony is, is kind of a little bit delicious, right? This is a guy who is saying he's so concerned about overseas corruption that he just needed to get to the bottom of this Burisma thing in Ukraine. But, but the act is uh, applicable to U.S. companies not bribing foreign governments. Right, and it's ironic that he asked a former oil executive that because what they do, they, they spend I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars a year to, well, attempt to comply with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. But it's clear that, you know, he had a lot of overseas dealings that, that uh, let's just say Donald Trump is not a fan of sun, sunlight. <laughs> yeah, I, w I would disagree with that. I mean, um, uh, he's he's exactly the kind of person who the FCPA law is aimed at. Um, does a lot of business overseas uh, in regulated markets where you need government permission. Um, part of the plan in Moscow with the tower was to, to allegedly give Putin the top floor. That would have sent him straight to jail. And if you if you read up on just his old municipal history in New York. Um, uh, in fact, there's a great new book by a friend of ours, Andrea Bernstein, who's going to be here in another week or so, um, uh, in which she talks about all of the, the sort of political favor, you know, string pulling and, and you know, donations and stuff in, in Trump's early years in New York. Um, there's, there's been a lot of great reporting around the Trump project in Baku and Azerbaijan, right, right? which may well have, uh, you know, Republican Guard and Iranian money in it for all we know, as it, has been reported. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, this, I'll stop after this, but that was actually one of the original motives that we had in hiring Chris Steele to poke around in Russia, was that um, Russia's a notoriously corrupt place. Donald Trump seemed to go there a lot. There was a lot of mystery around what he was doing over there. Um, and I thought maybe he got involved in some corruption schemes. Um, it was a logical you know, uh, uh, hypothesis. Um, we don't know whether it's right or wrong yet. Uh, you commented on uh, Trump's relation to Putin, which is peculiar. And another peculiarity is his insistence of not having his tax uh, returns published. Now, I wonder whether you could uh, tell us or speculate on what is possibly hidden in his tax returns that he desperately tries to hide and once you have done that, I want to add that I haven't read your book, but maybe I'm naive, but what you present here sounds as overwhelming evidence that this president is dangerous for the country and is a criminal. My question is, how come he's still president? <laughs> now, wait a minute. Is it because your evidence is not substantiated and is dubious, or is it because there's a mechanism in the country 
that prevents that evidence from doing its due work? Well, I mean, I, I would say that, first of all, the courts have held up pretty good, notwithstanding, um, you know, the press around Mitch McConnell's judge train, uh, et cetera. You know, Deutsche Bank will be compelled to produce some records, right? Donald Trump has not prevailed in his to in quashing suits against some of some of his female claimants. So, you know, that said, it's it when you have a pliant Republican majority in Congress that is willing to protect this guy, I mean, Mitch McConnell has announced that he is not in, interested in a fair and impartial trial. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to dislodge a sitting president. Um, the the Constitution is designed to make that so. Um, so, you know, fundamentally, um, having obtained the presidency, he's protected by the very things he's trying to tear down, um, which are the principles in the Constitution. Um, this is a massive test of our institutions. Um, it's not over. We're in the middle of it. Um, so uh, whether uh, the person that you describe, which I'm not going to dispute your characterizations, um, uh, actually gets away with it is, is yet to be decided. On the tax question, I would just say, um, Generally, someone who fights that hard to not let you see his taxes probably isn't paying any. I mean, I also think that what, what's in there is, you know, what the New York Times reported about a year and a half ago, which is that he's not nearly as wealthy as he claims to be, right. and that he is the beneficiary of his, you know, rent money from his dad's projects going back to the 50s and 60s. So, right, so the Occam's razor explanations for this are that he doesn't pay as, as much tax in, much in taxes and he's probably not as rich as he says. We think both of those are true. Um, it, there could be other things in there that are, you know, dramatically worse than that. That's probably a minimum case scenario. But you have to remember, he sued Tim O'Brien, the New York Times reporter, based on the claim that he wasn't as, in, in the book, that he was not as wealthy as he said. So it's a, it's a raw nerve for him. I worry about how many people in our government might be compromised. We've talked about Trump. In your work, did you develop a concern about other key political figures who may also have some of the same ties? Because it would not be surprising if the Russians planned something that would be broad in scope to well, a large number of people. Um, that's a great question. So uh, I, I've been in Washington almost all my adult life, and I've written about uh, foreign influence in Washington, you know, on and off for like 30 years. Um, and w we should be really, really concerned about the, the depth of the foreign penetration of our government and political system. Um, in, the, in the wake of the Cold War, you know, I mean, the Russians have always tried to penetrate our political system and steal our secrets and undermine our government and our democracy. Um, and so have the Chinese. Um, but it's only been in recent years that they figured out what our, our, our true soft spot is. Mm. And that is the fact that our politics are open, right? That's what's good about our politics, right? We, have, um, we let people uh, uh, participate. We encourage participation from all comers. Um, but we've gone so far with that that we've gotten rid of all the rules on money. And um, we have decided uh, that we're not all that concerned about whether uh, foreigners um, you know, get involved in our political system. And so we've, uh, so over the years, I've written stories about other politicians who took money. I wrote a lot about Bill Clinton and the Chinese back in the mid 90s. Um, th these are really serious concerns that get very little attention. And the, and the Electoral College is, is designed for an asymmetric approach, right? So all you need to do is flip those, seven, that stadium full of people in those three counties through the Rust Belt and, and you win. Right, but, so it's it is conducive to an asymmetrical disinformation game. But I mean, you know, it, we talk about this in the book uh, because there's this secretly recorded tape that we didn't have anything to do with secretly recording a bunch of Russia uh, Republicans joking about how, you know, there's two people on Putin's payroll, Trump and this Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, and they're they're yucking it up over this. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, by the way. Uh, yeah, Kevin McCarthy. So um, the point we try to make in the book is, you know. We think there's probably some institutional resistance in the Republican Party to opening this up and discussing just how bad the Russian penetration is, um, because to some extent they're aware of it already. And I, I would I would add that the same is true in the UK um, of the conservatives, where there is a conspiracy of silence about the extent to which 
the Russian um, spies um, have infiltrated the, the British political system. Last thing I'll say is it's not just the Republicans. Um, uh, the Russians are not Republicans, they're Russians, right? And um, if they you know, see an opportunity to do the same thing on the other side of the aisle, they will and they have. Did anything in the financial investigation point towards the NRA and the Russians colluding? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. We forgot, we forgot to mention that. I mean, one, one of the reasons we wrote the book is because we were tired as being, you know, kind of thought of and portrayed as the dossier guys. And in fact, you know, um, a lot of what we did had nothing to do with Chris Steele, and he didn't even know we were doing it. And one of those things uh, was that we became suspicious of the National Rifle Association. They had way too much money, and they seemed to have a lot of weird connections of their own to Russia and Russians. Um, and so uh, we started collecting uh, information on this, and eventually um, became very suspicious of this young woman who lived in Tenley Town and um, practiced Tai Chi at the Tai Chi Center there, went to American University, um, and seemed to have no earthly excuse for being here. Um, it also just seemed odd that th there would be a sort of Russian uh, arm of the NRA since their gun laws in Russia are quite strict. Um, and the only person who's allowed to have a gun is Putin, right? <laughs> and so it didn't make so so we talked about We talked about Maria Butina uh, in, in uh, Glenn mentioned in the testimony to the... Um, wide and uh, ridicule of none other than the Wall Street Journal editorial page. And Fox News. Don't and Fox, good old Fox News. So they, we, we took some hits for that. So we, we were portrayed as conspiracy theorists for this loopy idea that this woman might be a some kind of Russian agent. Um, and in fact, we had, we had, as the book recounts, um, you know, pointed this out to people at the Department of Justice as well, uh, confidentially in, in late 2016. Um, you know, so, you know, yeah, we feel vindicated by the fact that they've now documented that all of that is true. And I, I, I think there's more to that story coming. Yeah, going back to the Mueller report for a second, uh, a great deal of the power of that report was dissipated by the current Attorney General's reflection on it. And do you have any insights into why he rode into town and immediately took, you know, took those kinds of measures? I mean, I don't know that we have any special insight beyond what's been widely and publicly reported. Um, the, the New Yorker just did a pretty useful profile of him this week. Uh, you know, he is a company man when it comes to, you know, he cloaks his approach in this argument that the president is, uh, you know, unimpeachable, frankly, uh, in a presidential power, in a view of presidential power, which is kind of off the charts as a... In, in, in legal scholar dumb um, but I don't know that we have any special insights in his but you know he was very effective in seizing the narrative for a time not just in the Mueller report but in the release of the inspector general's report too which we should we should mention you know at at bottom didn't really find that there are a lot of you know uh, jaywalkers en route to responding to a crime in progress by FBI officials what it really said was the FBI was tardy in responding, right? They didn't respond to, the, the, the IG report actually takes issue with the FBI for not responding to Chris Steele's information for seven weeks. And Bill Barr has, you know, to Glenn's point about propaganda, suppressed a lot of this, a lot of these interpretations. I don't really have a question, but I just <laughs> I just finished reading your book, and I read so many political books, and I learned so much from your book. I think it's so well written and explains things so well. I'm not a plant. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. <laughs> I, 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 I was surprised. It surprised me that I learned so much because I, I watch everything, read everything I can. And I learned so much from your book. It's very well written and very precise. And I thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you.
and, and that's not my mom. <laughs> so, um, one of you said in the book on the uh, with, in the phone call to Ken Benzinger, Benzinger, uh, however you pronounce his name. Um, as soon as the story went uh, live, you're gonna get people killed. Um, if you could go back in time, would you prevent the story from going out uh, now that you know the outcome as of today, or would you? let it happen, quote unquote. Well, so th that episode um, <clears throat> is recounted uh, and Glenn testified to it extensively. You know, what happened was uh, Chris Steele figured out that uh, through an intermediary that um, John McCain might be interested in this information and his, his reporting. And he and we facilitated the delivery of a copy of the dossier to John McCain. Um, Ken Benzinger, because he's a great reporter, figured out that uh, a, a way to a way to review this material, uh, and John McCain's aide let him photograph it. Right. So, you know, there's nothing really I think that we would do different. Um, we, we wish he hadn't done that. We wish he hadn't uh, done that for yeah. the security of sources and methods and Chris Steele safety and yeah. those of his sources. But in terms of you know wanting to report to a to the competent authorities what he perceived as the intelligence professional was a serious matter uh, of course we would do that all over again yeah i mean i, I would just add I, we don't sit around trying to second guess like what we did in a lot of these circumstances um uh, for a whole variety of reasons including our sanity but um um you know we we tried to do the best we could and we tried to do the right thing um, I, I think the question you're answering, we can just say um, the, 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 publish, the publishing of the dossier um, certainly changed, you know, um, history and brought to light concerns that were shared at the highest levels of government and not being articulated um, and led to um, a lot of scrutiny that Donald Trump deserved and probably uh, prevented him from doing a lot of uh, things that um, would really have costed this country dearly, including um, a uh, dropping the sanctions on Russia, which was clearly at the top of their agenda in uh, the beginning of 2017. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate Thank you that. all. That Thank you very wonderful. much.